Protests in Russia have not happened on any great scale against the war compared to the dissent seen in Belarus a few years ago, and of course to the ferocity of the various Ukrainian revolutions. But protest and dissent within the Russian elite, the political and diplomatic establishment, or from amongst the Silviki, is even more of a rarity. My guest today is one of the few exceptions. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please do like and subscribe as it'll help our audience discover the fantastic speakers on the channel. Boris Bondyarev is a former Russian diplomat who worked for the Russian permanent mission to the United Nations office at Geneva from 2019 until his resignation in May 2022 in protest over the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He has a unique insight into the Russian diplomatic service and the workings of the Russian delegation at the UN and how it relates back to the center for Moscow. Boris, I'm very grateful for you to uh, join me on the channel today. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Well, I've seen quite a few of your, your interviews and hopefully we're going to sort of uh, ask uh, some questions that are perhaps a little bit different from the obvious ones you get asked in the many uh, interviews you've done. But let's start with something I know you've written about, which is the day in the life. You know, what was your life as a diplomat like day to day prior to the invasion? Well, well, it was uh, it was life for, for like uh, any other civil servant of my level, so to speak. So yeah, you get up, you have your breakfast, you go to your office, you do your job, you have some meetings, maybe with some uh, other diplomats from other countries and delegations. Usually, you attend some uh, some events, meeting conferences in the UN office or somewhere else in Geneva. And before COVID, there were plenty of uh, meetings, gatherings, events. Uh, some, sometime, uh, sometimes, I recall, I, I had a few such meetings a day, and I, I didn't even have to didn't even have to have lunch or or dinner because I had them during those meetings. <laughs> like like there was a lot of receptions and all. When when COVID came, yeah, it, it, it changed everything and uh, diplomatic life. Uh, moved mostly into the online online ways of, of of functioning so to speak it was very unusual it was not very comfortable at first uh, but then yeah we all uh, we all uh, uh, had to to do with that and uh, then but then when the covid restrictions were lifted in part and then altogether in 2021 and and so, uh, well, they mostly lifted in 2021 in Switzerland. So the life, well, got back to normal almost, almost. But it was not, I think, I don't think that it is now, it is fully back to that pre-COVID normal because it is not that intense as it used to be because a lot of events are held now in online format which before COVID was almost impossible. Everything was offline. Everything was in a good old diplomacy way. So now the diplomatic practice is, is changed. Yeah, sure. And you talked about your status and your your, your rank within the hierarchy. Um, I'd be really interesting to sort of understand a bit about how that reporting structure works. How much autonomy did you have? Were the sort of messages that uh, or, or, or statements that you may have been making in various meetings, are they sort of scripted or are they decided in groups? Do they come from the center or as diplomats, did you have a degree of autonomy to craft those messages locally? Well, I would say that this uh, great level of auto autonomy has always has also been quite, um, well, we used to be more autonomous before COVID, so to speak. But then with all these online and hybrid modes in place, the center, I mean, the MFA, the headquarters, they began to be more proactive in this. And sometimes they were very active and they just like pushed us aside. But sometimes there were a lot of a series of events, for instance, under the um, auspice of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, CCW, in Geneva, when there was, there, there, there was some confrontation 
between Russia, of course, and Western countries. It, before the war, I mean, 2021, it was to do, it had something to do with the uh, this online hybrid mode of, uh, of this uh, CCW. And then after a few rounds of cons informal consultations, which we as a Geneva mission were in charge of, Moscow just pushed us aside and they said that they would, would do it themselves from Moscow directly. Yeah. So you see the autonomy is not the right word to, uh, not the correct term to, um, to define our situation. And uh, really there is very, very, um, you know, very little autonomy, I believe, in what Russian embassies, Russian missions abroad can do now, because they all have, first of all, quite strict and uh, concrete uh, instructions, which they have to implement. And they may choose how they would implement them, when and where and with whom they would talk about that. I mean, for instance, if we got these uh, instructions in Geneva, I could decide that I should go to that man and talk to him. Or maybe my colleague would go to another guy and talk to him and how we do it, maybe we, 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 we do some things orally, or we can write some kind of a memo or a note verbal or something like that. But it's, you know, it's the freedom of, uh, uh, it's a technical kind of freedom. It's not that we were free or autonomous to uh, change the concept, to do some political things. And if we are also to propose some uh, political decisions to be taken by Moscow, of course, we also, uh, it is our proposals, we send them to Moscow with our considerations, with our advices, with our analysis, with our proposals, what to do next and so on. So that's, that's how it is. Do you think that is that much different from how the structure of Western diplomatic corps work? I mean, to an extent, they also have to reflect the policy of elected governments and the central bureaucracy. Do you think it's radically different in the West or are there some similarities? Well, I believe there are similarities, of course, because the diplomacy is uh, something which very... Uh, you, you, don't, you, don't, you, you don't say that there is US diplomacy, I mean, in, in, in terms of diplomatic service. It's Russian diplomatic service, it's Chinese diplomatic service, because it is all have something in common. Because it is about diplomacy, it is about foreign policy. And diplomacy is the, is the compilation of methods by which you perform your foreign policy. So it's, uh, it's all about talks, about meetings with people, about transferring your messages, your uh, political stance, decisions, everything. But how it is arranged, how it is organized can differ from country to country, of course. And uh, I believe that Western diplomacy has their own um, differences with us, of course. I, maybe they may be more uh, mobile for some, some, for some reasons, but also they may be as, the, as bureaucratic as our Russian diplomats. For instance, I know the, well, the US um, Department of State has a staff uh, many times more than Russian MFA, for instance. Uh, Russian MFA is about seven or 8,000 jobs, both in headquarters and abroad altogether. And the uh, State Department is, I, I've heard about 30 or 40,000, something like, like that. So it's totally different, different organization. And of course, it, it also uh, has its impact on how American diplomats do their job. And uh, Russia has also its uh, own traditions not all of them are good, I believe. Russian diplomacy is very closed. It's not transparent. It is, it's like Russia today. It is very, um, it is a very, very uh, informal. I mean, it's based on informal ties and contacts between people rather than on some institutions or procedures. And of course, we know that uh, while the uh, leadership in Western diplomacy is rotated on a regular basis. We see that the Russian uh, MFA has its leadership for 18 years without any changes. And of course it has its impact. 
So is there a greater role then? So you've talked about personalities and relationships being more important than, say, processes. Um, but uh, do you think also the fact that people don't necessarily retake jobs, is there is there more potentially nepotism and corruption in terms of getting the job and retaining the job? And is this a less movement within within the uh, the diplomatic service? If you imply that to get a job in MFA take some corruption, I don't know, some bribery, then I I don't think that it is the the, the reality. Mm. Uh, it nepotism is, more, it is, is a little is, more. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Nepotism, you know, family ties, some mm -hmm. dynasties. Yes, it's more or less. It, and it has been, you know, for, for many decades from Soviet mm -hmm. times. I know a lot of today's diplomats, like my my generation, they are, so they, they have the parents in MFA and even grandparents. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is more or less natural for people, for diplomats to to try to arrange their own uh, children's future within this uh, MFA where they know everything, they know anybody. And it is, of course, it's much, it's easier. Mm. It's easier for them. And uh, for and so uh, it is, um, and of course, MFA has always been, has always has had this image of kind of a, of a structure allowed, which allows its, staff to travel abroad. You know, in Soviet times, it was a dream of many people because the liberty of uh, freedom of uh, to travel was not, uh, you know, was not, doesn't, didn't exist for many Soviet people. Diplomats and some other people, very limited quantity of them was, was allowed to do so. And still uh, now there is also some kind of charm when general public speaks about Minister of Foreign Affairs, about diplomats. So it is, and of course, frankly speaking, to be a Russian diplomat now, I mean, before the war was quite a comfortable job. No, you get decent money, especially when you are stationed abroad. Well, you don't pay for your apartment, you don't pay for your car, you don't pay any taxes, you can withdraw it on VAT. It's, well, you know, you can travel, you have your diplomatic privileges and immunities. It's all very, very nice, you know. So um, you cannot, you know, you can't complain anyway. Mm. So of course, everybody, every parent would like to for their children to have such kind of, a, you know, care carefree job. That's it. Mm. So yes, so, yes, yeah. this, yes, nepotism. Yes, it, it, it mm. plays a role, but also uh, I would say the f favoritism is also a very, very big, a very big um, disadvantage. Now in in Russia, I can I can tell I, I know a few examples of people who are who are making a very fast career, and nobody understands why, except that they enjoy some kind of a, an inexplicable favor from the higher higher up people. You know, so, so that's also it's also it's, it's not a rare thing. And that's not limited to the diplomatic corps, is it? I mean, that is potentially the Silvi Key or the FSB, even the media, you know, having a hand up, having someone you know who can make an introduction. I imagine that same connection of personal relationships counts in other areas of society as well. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, there was also a few years ago a joke that uh, if you want to get a job in Moscow, well, you, you, the uh, washing machine with good connections has better chances to get a, a, a good job than you, even if you have a lot of diplomas, but you don't have connections. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's true, more or less, uh, not 100%, of course. But for instance, when I uh, uh, learned in my Gimoa University and there, there were a lot of uh, my uh, mates who were from other other regions, other cities, who had no connections whatsoever with diplomats or officials. You know, they were just 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 simple simple ordinary guys, and many of them are now uh, making good career in MFA or in some other agency. 
but I don't think it, this situation can be so easily imagined for today. Today, because those all those social lifts are sealed very effectively now. So if you if you get to the MFA, it does mean that you will have your promotion like that. And of course, you talked about it being a comfortable life, actually a life that many people would aspire to, um, being in the diplomatic services and the, the 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 perks that you get. What I'm interested in is is when the morality that clearly you've made a decision based on uh, you know moral judgments, not just personal judgments, because I imagine you're disadvantaged personally by. Uh, leaving that job and leaving that status, you've left not, not just a career behind, but uh, friends and acquaintances as well. Um, there are various points, aren't there, where Russia's gone from being a, a sort of informational autocracy, a hybrid system, where you could feasibly say, well, it's not full repression, it's it's not Stalinism, it's not this, you know, and 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 make some kind of accommodation. I imagine 2008, invasion of Georgia, that's a tough point, but most people go, well, it's just, you know, that's going to pass. It's a small war. Then there's 2014. Well, then there's 2012 in Bolotna. And then there's 2014, the invasion of Crimea. None of those were triggers for many people to either leave the country or reassess their careers. For you, that trigger point came this year with a full-blown Ukrainian war. So I'd love to know from you how you felt and why that was a trigger for you, but why the previous steps towards full-blown autocracy were not trigger points? I think uh, when it was Georgia or Crimea, I was too young and I didn't think much about those things. And the, I started to understand that our uh, country was going in the wrong direction. Maybe and I started to have a clear, more or less clear, clear vision of that. I think by the end of the um, by the end of the second terms of Putin, so 2008, like 2009, I, I remember. Uh, so Georgian war, as we say, it was uh, regarded widely as the kind of a defensive operation, because even the European Union confirmed that Georgian government started this uh, assault and like they said they assaulted Russian peacekeepers and blah 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 and then and then of course um, well we didn't pay much attention to that frankly because it was very short it was well not bloody so to speak yes it was and uh, and of course it was like Russia won this war very swift war we were attacked and then we are retaliated and it was a success it was quite encouraging because you uh, since you 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 were you were well acquainted with russia you know that in 90 for, for the, the in 90s uh, people were feeling that they were like humiliated by the end of the cold war they were like betrayed and humiliated by the west uh, for whom, for which they like uh, destroyed their own country and they got, got nothing in return, but only this uh, anarchy, the chaos, the uh, criminals, you know, in uh, operating in open in open day and so on. And uh, and in 2000, this uh, resentment still was was in on the agenda. So this 2008, it was like the first clear Russian military success. And Russian Russian public uh, public doesn't um, mm, uh, so knowledge or sensation. Yeah, something. Yeah, like this is is still quite uh, militarized. Mm. Yes, we were brought up in Soviet Union on military tales, military movies, military parades, and all. It's some something that is still in our brain. So. Uh, and this military success was kind of how oh, we are not that weak anymore. Now we are strong. Now we, mm, they will have to respect us somehow. That was, I would say, quite encouraging. And I, I also shared kind of this emotion. Well, I was uh, much younger, and I didn't, I said, didn't uh, think much about that because my uh, 
profile job was about in 2008. I was almost I was about uh, climate change and something. So very far from actual politics. And yet, anyway, I started to suspect that something wasn't right because there were already a lot of corruption scandals. There were already a lot of things that were not didn't seem right. And when Medvedev came, President Medvedev came, I I I, um, I remember there were hopes that he may be better than Putin, maybe more liberal, more democratic, and then he may might be turning against him and preventing him from returning. Because for many people, it was more or less clear that Medvedev was just to like to keep the seat warm for these uh, four years, and then Putin would, would come back. I was going to say that's an interesting point because um, I find it fascinating that you're, you're sort of inside, you know, the diplomatic service, as it were, and and potentially, you know, you're hearing and seeing things that perhaps are not on the media. And, you know, to someone who's incredibly cynical like myself, having been in St. Petersburg in the 90s, it's made me rather cynical about everything, and not just Russia, but about Western politics, about the media, about all sorts of things. And immediately when Medvedev was put in that position, it seemed to me absolutely clear, you know, how that would end up, that he would be pushed aside uh, and he was simply playing a game, you know, holding holding the seat for, for Putin to return. Um, but I know not everyone felt that, but it just seemed to me that that is, that is the game that's being played here. Well, there were people who did hope that Medvedev could be more uh, more serious and more um, more aggressive, and he would not surrender his seat to Putin just just for nothing. Yeah, so there were hope that th that kind of clash would arise within the Russian elite, and that would lead to some kind of liberalization because the return of Putin would like. Uh, would, would 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 have been seen, and it was seen as a as a progress of this police state, which he started to build in his, uh, his second second term, more or less. Um, but Medvedev did act sometimes quite decisively, and I don't think that he, not in all cases, of course, but in some cases, I don't think he didn't even consult with Putin. For instance, it was uh, about Libya, for instance. I was watching Libya, Libya quite closely. I was in Mongolia then, but it was a very interesting case about this Libyan uprising in 2011. And I was watching it closely with all channels and internet, which I could uh, get access to. And also I heard from my colleagues that there was a scandal in MFA um, that uh, Russian ambassador in Libya, uh, Mr. Chamov, Vladimir Chamov, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure what his first name, but Chamov, uh, he uh, sent uh, messages to Moscow regarding this uh, planning the UN Security Council resolution on no-fly zone and something. And he uh, was arguing that we should not grant this authorization for NATO to bomb Libya because it was, well, it was crystal clear that this no-fly zone would mean the uh, full-scale intervention of NATO. It's not just NATO would would uh, watch over the, the, the sky over the Libya and allowed Gaddafi to suppress all these uh, rebels. No, of course not. It, 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 it meant that NATO would get, would get involved into that. And of course, Gaddafi did have no chance to stand against. And our ambassador argued that we had our interest in Libya. We had a lot of investments since Soviet times there. And uh, Gaddafi was our good partner and all. And so we maybe we shouldn't uh, abandon him for our Western uh, partners. And, and uh, without having any, any, you know, any advantage or any, anything from that. So, but his uh, messages were dismissed by the high authority. And then I think after one of these 
after one of these uh, rebukes, he wrote something that the current policy towards Libya is, is a kind of a treason, in his opinion. And then I was told Medvedev personally uh, wrote a resolution on this cable that if this ambassador doesn't like my policy, then he should go home, something like that. And he was like recalled immediately. And that must be quite unusual, that kind of dissent from you know government policy is is yeah. very rare, yeah. Yes, yes. And I also believe that this ambassador was not alone, that the MFA leadership more or less shared that uh, that vision, that approach, because it was um I say that uh, this conflict, the conflict was between Medvedev, who believed to uh to follow more modern approach, more Western-like approach, more the approach to the West to make this uh, reload, uh, or, uh, to make this reset of the uh, uh, relations with the West. And the MFA, which was more uh, Soviet style, and they were thinking mostly in this old Soviet, well, we can say now imperial things. And so, but but what is uh, what is very um, symbolic is that MFA did not stand openly for the ambassador. And I mm -hmm. thought, and I, I shared with my friends also that if Minister was Lavrov already there, if Lavrov said that if you don't want my ambassador, then maybe I also can go. And if Minister and his deputy ministers would just resign. That would be maybe something that would change. That may that could have been, you know, maybe um, they they uh, they could have been something that the MFA uh, would become not the thing that it, it's it's become today. Because it seems also, that the instincts and strategy of both Lavrov and Putin are almost completely aligned with the concept of autocracy, with, with centralized uh, sort of control. And they do seem to align themselves with other leaders in the world and policies which, um, you know, enhance and protect the autocratic style of government, as opposed to, you say, more sort of perhaps modern or liberal or um, anything that's going to erode that mode of government is it is it quite clear that there's this difference then of uh, of worldview perhaps um, prior to this war between say Putin and Lavrov and Medvedev and others? Well, Medvedev, uh, Medvedev uh, did the same things. He was also uh, quite of an autocratic ruler, being as president of Russia and president of Russia even constitutionally. Uh, is a very, very autocratic uh, position. So he has a lot of uh, power, uh, much more than the president of the United States, for instance. Mm. And, and he's also absolutely not controlled by any of branches of power, you know, not executive, not judiciary, not anything. Um, so he has, he, he just like, like an emperor, but you know, by, by title, you know, and some kind of, there is some kind of a fake elections, which he has to go through every now six years. But then it's, it's, a, it's kind of a monarchy, but it's, and no, I mean, in this example, which I mentioned about Libya, I mean that MFA, the MFA leadership was, very characteristically aligned with their leaders, with their own uh, high leadership. I mean, I mean, the President Medvedev or Putin. So they did not defend their own guy, someone of of them of, of themselves. Yeah, because this ambassador was a Korean ambassador, Ambassador Chamov. He was all his life from attaché to ambassador. He forty, I don't know, forty five years. In foreign service, mm. he wasn't someone from from you know 
from the side. Uh, they they uh, they didn't okay they didn't abandon him at all because in a few years he was reinstated in an ambassador to some other Arab country so it was okay. But they didn't do anything to protect him and to protect their own position. Even if they were keen to support his position, while Medvedev just said one word and they all said, mm -hmm. okay, no problem, as you wish. So yeah. no, 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 they showed no, no agency, yeah? Mm -hmm. But we're dealing with questions at that time of, uh, you know, diplomatic questions, which I would almost say are within the normal spectra of disputes, language, etc. Even, you know, you'd find those, I'm sure, in Western establishment as well. They're matters of standard foreign policy. Probably when you read the statements, they're quite dry. If we fast forward to this year, um, and the way in which diplomatic communications have been weaponized, the way in which, you know, the foreign department um, communications have been weaponized. You can now go to the, uh, let's say, the Twitter accounts uh, of Russian embassies around the world. And rather than matters of foreign policy, you know, whether you agree or not, um, it's no longer foreign policy that is being uh, broadcast from these channels it's near sort of genocidal hate. It's fairly, very extreme language and extraordinary, uh, you know, accusations and lies and, and nonsense, which I know you, you'll have seen. How do you think that is deforming the entire uh, business of diplomacy? Well, I think it should be a good, uh, you know, vac uh, vaccine for any other diplomatic services all around the world. So they know what not to do because of, and um, uh, because now Russian diplomacy uh, is showing a lot of examples of, I don't, I don't know even how to say it, of, of ill thought things. You know, because I, I, I don't know and nobody understands, I believe, what they want to achieve by uh, publishing those tweets and uh, these uh, calls for kind of a genocide, these threats to Ukrainians. And okay, coming back to Mr. President Medvedev, maybe if you follow his Telegram channel, it is also very popular now because he publishes very regularly some kind of uh, those things that, that even in the, in the peak of the Cold War, Soviet Propaganda didn't uh, allow itself to 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 go to to say to sound. It is something like well, a lot of people really discussing that he may be really kind of um, crazy in, in the medical sense of that. But it is all uh, very. But sometimes when I read his uh, statements in his Telegram channel, sometimes I see that they repeat sometimes word by word some some cables you know it's very close to what mfa the, today's mfa language and uh, it's, well, of course he reads those cables as he's a uh, he's still uh, he's, he's deputy putin in this uh, the national security council so he he he, he still has the access to them so of course they have impact on his on his ruined mind um, but I think it's a symptom. It's a symptom of of their first of all incompetence, because when you when you say some very blatant words, it is easier for you to hide to cover your own incompetence. By like that, if you blame Western enemies for, for all your failures, of course, it's easier for you to say that it's not you, it's them. It's, well, it's bureaucratic. It's, it's clear bureaucracy. And of course, uh, I think it's a symptom of uh, this moral bankruptcy. Because people just don't, I don't believe they don't, they really think about what they are typing, what they are writing, what they are publishing. If they just start to think about it, what they want to do, they may, I don't know, they may, you know, 
they may not do that because since, well, I was an engineer, even before the war, and we were writing our reports. And some colleagues were, were very, um, they were very agitated sometimes, and they wanted to use really hard, heavy, and I was a dangerous vocabulary. And it's, you know, it's a very, it's a, it, when, you, when, you, when you write a report, it is very important to choose proper words. Of course, it, it also depends on which impression you want to, 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 to you want your, uh, your, your addressee to have. And sometimes I, I had to tell them that, guys, what do you, why are you going to write like this? Do you want to war? I asked them a few times about the war, really, because it was uh, something that they really demanded to start the war right now, because uh, Westerners, someone else did this and that and that. And after my interventions, they said sometimes, well, mm, no, no, not the war. Well, you're, you're, you're exaggerating. No, we didn't mean that. Okay, let's, let's uh, smooth it sometime, some, 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 somehow. Okay. So, but and that's become the norm now, hasn't it? Those sort of extraordinary inflammatory statements. And it's not just obviously through the diplomatic service. In a way, it seems the diplomatic service has become just a megaphone for something that is being generated higher up. Not possibly through government policy, but is it true that the propagandist wing, you know, the state media, Solovio, Semignan, and others, it seems that this language and tone and threat is actually emanating uh, from from the sources of propaganda as opposed to, you know, maybe traditional foreign policy um, creating centres of the government. Yeah, yes, it is, it is all, uh, I would say, intertwined. Because the propaganda uses MFA, MFA uses propaganda vocabulary. And they, they, it, it's now, now it's very hard to distinguish between what is what. It is, it is all one giant propaganda machine, like propaganda, MFA, which delivers only propaganda right now. Other agencies, which I don't know what, what they're doing, but they're doing mostly propaganda things, both domestically and internationally. So the Russian foreign policy is about propaganda. It's 100% propaganda, nothing else. They are it's not, they're not selling anything except by propaganda. And in making the, uh, you know, the statement that you've made, uh, obviously you have sacrificed career. I think you've written that, that friendships as well, um, uh, certainly. And, and, you know, we'll come to that in a minute about, you know, potentially the threat or the risk to you personally. But isn't there something else that's been lost this year? And that is sort of moral and cultural certainties. Uh, I mean, until this time, whether you like Russian foreign policy or not, there were many, many Russians, wealthy and otherwise, all through Europe, traveling, tourists, studying, oligarchs, obviously buying up big chunks of the country. Um, Russia was much more integrated with the world community. And, you know, whatever failings there were, whether it was even Crimea and so on, the West could kind of brush those off and do normal business. People could read and enjoy Russian literature without, let's say, the, the moral baggage that now seems to be coming down. How do you feel personally about those sort of former certainties? The sort of, I would even say the sort of confidence that came with Russian culture a lot of this is being tarnished this year, isn't it? A lot of it is uh, tainted by the events that are happening. And, and how long will that last? Well, it is very depressing to see this picture, really. And it's even more depressing because you understand that it is, well, technically one man's fault. And it is a very important topic because now the West, West society seems to be so gladly and easily um, forgetting all these so kind liberal values. For instance, these uh, 
um, presumptions of presumption of innocence, for instance, or uh, the fact that the guilt can be on the individual and not collective. And all this talks about collective responsibility. And all this talk that it is Russians, not Putin, who which invaded Ukraine. And it is not Putin, but Russians who wanted this war and all. Because in the, in the very beginning of the war, all Western countries, all Western diplomats, all Western media called it the Putin's war, Putin's war of choice, unjustified Putin's war, blah, blah, blah. Now they call it it's Russian war. It's Russian. And sometimes they even try, they look like they're trying to put Putin out of this equation. Like it is Ukraine and Europe and all other Western world, free world of freedom, world of liberties and all. And Russia, Russia, which is genetically or historically is bound to be aggressive, to be a kind of, you know, different, different civilization. Nobody mentions Putin. I wonder why, because sometimes it is, you know, it, 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 you may think that if Putin now asks for political asylum in, in, a, in a European country, he will be granted, you know, because no. he will say, yeah, I'm not to blame, you know, those Russians, though they made me, they made me, they forced me to invade Ukraine. I didn't want, they, you know, Russians, they're not, they're genetically, genetically different species, you know. I That's can guarantee very, very... there'll be a mob trying to uh, finish him off like Gaddafi. I think there's plenty of us who uh, wouldn't let him oh, off the hook. But, um, <laughs> plenty I mean, of you, plenty of you, you, know, you mean European people. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of anger uh, still against him personally. Uh, but but you're right, uh, that, that anger is, is also morphed into something broader. And I think a lot of people, and I didn't want to ask the question about protests because I think it's a, a fairly obvious one because um, it's very difficult to actually protest in Russia. I mean, you risk, uh, you risk torture, you risk beatings, and it's understandable why, you know, the, the, there aren't widespread protests. It's a, it's a full blown police state. Um, and I think a lot of the media sort of ignore that fact. Um, but, yes. you know, it must've felt like this. I mean, my, relatives um, escaped Nazi Germany as victims of that in the 1930s. And when they came to Britain, they were interned. They were put into essentially a concentration camp until it could be figured out whether they were an agent or whether they were not. So the things you're describing are grossly unfair, but at the same time, they're not new and they're not unique to how Russians are being treated, because in wartime situation in the 1930s, you know, Britain did exactly the same. The, the, rightly or wrongly, the US did the same to Japanese citizens and interned those until it could be figured out whether they were, uh, you know, agents of the enemy power or so on. So yeah, I, I'm I'm not you know saying any of this is right or wrong, but it's it's not unique to the current circumstance. Well, it's not unique, but okay. UK and Germany were at war at those times, yeah, officially. Europe is not at war with Russia officially. Mm. I say it is de facto, of course, and the United States and NATO is in fact at war with Russia. Russia understands that, I mean, Kremlin. Um, though I, I believe they didn't think about it in the, in the first place. But since it is not the legal state of war, then why Russian should be uh, discriminated? And I don't say about this uh, um, visa ban or uh, restrictions for Russian tourists. Of course, mm -hmm. I personally believe that it is not ethical for people to travel around Europe while your own country is bombing another country and killing people. And yes, but I cannot answer for those people because they obviously don't think about it. The tragedy of Russia is that the majority of people are not thinking about the war. They don't care about it. And it's not because they're genetically, you know, warmongering or something, but it is because they, well, they don't know about it. They, are inform is they live in their own information space created by propaganda. And they don't have to get out of this information bubble. They are quite comfortable. You know, 20% of Russian population lives officially beyond this uh, threshold of poverty. So they're just, they are destitute. 
And the other 80%, I mean, of those 80%, maybe half lives just on this threshold. So they, in fact, they are also destitute. So those people just survive. They don't care about what is going on in, in, the, in the nearest town. They are fully concentrated on their own survival. And of course, they, in, in the evening when they watch the TV, they got this portion of propaganda and they are pretty, pretty you know, satisfied with that because they don't have strength, they don't have resources to investigate what is really the truth. They don't need it yet. Of course, and that is why, you know, and we can blame them for that, of course, but we also must understand that those people are not well educated, most of them. They are not well, well fed, they are not well paid. And I think European people must understand that those people, it's a giant country who lives much, much worse than even the most, the poorest European country. And those people are very easy prey for all this propaganda everywhere. Like Germans who are under Hitler, like uh, Serbs who are under Milosevic, for instance. It's all the same. And how do we break and that cycle? Because, you know, by the sounds of things, we've talked about Medvedev, we've talked about sort of Putin, and, and there's always the constant hope in the West that somehow the regime is going to be fragile, somehow the regime is divided, and we try to apply the sort of logic of the fairly chaotic politics that we have. You know, Britain's had how many prime ministers in the last few years? Um, we apply that logic and we 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 anticipate that somehow Russia will behave in the same way. But it seems to me the elite is far more cohesive uh, because they're threatened, uh, because they have so much to lose. And it seems to me the fragility of the regime is is exaggerated because that's what we optimistically wish for. I don't know what your take on it is, though. Well, history teaches us that there is no no eternal regimes, yes, and no eternal dictators, and everyone, each dictator has its end. And uh, let's be optimistic about this. And, and I understand that economically, the Putin's regime uh, has exhausted all opportunities. They cannot maintain even the economic stability, not saying about economic growth. So they, they don't have Putin doesn't have anything to, to sell for his people. He can promise them everything. He, kept, he keeps promising everything every year, but uh, he cannot deliver those promises. And people, they understand it. They get to understand it every year more and more. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I believe he started this war, because he wanted this war to cement the society, to cement his power. Um, the regime doesn't seem, doesn't look fragile for now, yes. It is very well equipped, it is very well armed, it has millions of uh, those Siloviks, of its people who are really interested in, in surviving this regime, because without them, they, without these regimes, they would lose all the income and anything, because they are extremely incompetent in any other areas of life. Uh, they can only beat, you know, unarmed protesters and all, but they all need money and Putin pays them for their loyalty and this money he, 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 get, he gets from where? From the well, West, gas, from Europe. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And Europe is not very, you know, very, very quick to impose sanctions and all that. And with oil, I think that something must, must start this December, like oil embargo or something. But guess, well, we have yet to see what will be with the gas next year. And regarding some other uh, raw materials, which Russia still exports, like diamonds, like you know, wood, uh, metal, some of, they are not all restricted. They are not, not all sanctioned. And that gives uh, Putin Kind of uh, well, I, I I've heard this uh, figure that I, I, up to today Putin gets about one billion euros every day from European Union, and it's uh, more than enough to finance his own bodyguards and finance the war in Ukraine. And that's, that's all it. he 
is primarily interested in protecting the wealth that he has uh, extracted from the state and uh, protecting uh, you know his safety and position i i i doubt whether he gives much concern for the population as a whole and the level of living standards and so on he, that seems not to be one of his considerations i believe he uh, wholeheartedly despises people uh, of the population i mean and, uh, and but i think this this uh, picture is because it, it all has roots in 90s when this uh, oligarchy regime was created by president yeltsin in the mid of 90s and when more than 90% of all assets in russia was concentrated in less than 1% of population and it is still so and of course if less than 1% population has almost everything in your country and 90% and 99% of the population has well, literally almost nothing of course you will have to to have a dictatorship of a kind in place you cannot just afford a democracy because the next next elections new government will just confiscate everything you stole and you'll end up in prison or somewhere of course this uh, that's yeah is that the root of the ukrainian war in essence because right on putin's doorstep there's a substantial slavic ex-soviet state that was potentially moving away from the oligarchical nepotistic corrupt model not not fully you know and it's taken a very long time but through a series of revolutions through institutional changes it was starting to edge away and show a template for how that system of government can be dismantled is that the real reason you think the invasion happened or is it far more to do with internal politics i believe that the first and foremost reason is as i said is his uh, attempt to cement his grip to power first of all to make this war i evidently they planned for a very swift war swift victory and that they they would like to uh, repeat this uh, crimean experience and i think this uh, they uh, counted on that so um first of all so first of all it was a domestic domestic demand from putin himself and of course the second reason i believe it's his own you know im- im- imaginary historical studies so to speak that ukraine and russia are one nation and so on and so on they should be together and yes what you mentioned also i think plays a role in this uh, this uh, as he evidently sees ukraine as a kind of anti russia project something that again created by the west again created especially specifically to counter russian influence in the historical area of influence and it, might, it's all yeah. it's all based on these prejudices it's all based on these you know old old uh, obsolete uh, concepts which is and because putin is has an absolute power in russia his pers- all his personal traits now have a very significant role in everything unfortunately it's almost shakespearean isn't it where you know in shakespeare's plays if the king is ill or the king loses his mind the whole kingdom is destroyed and that's that medieval concept is is how what's playing out here um yeah yes you know some some especially some experts call this system russian system as a new new feudalism and i think that there's a lot of a lot of in common with feudal system really and uh, yes and uh, russia has always like loved shakespeare because i think we <laughs> we feel something something in common absolutely and a great translation as well um uh, my last question really is going to be around you know you personally and whether you feel safe because you are one of the exceptions you know there's very very few people who've taken the step that you've taken from any part of uh you know the russian administration or diplomatic service um and i know it's a different person a different part of the system but you know certainly uh litvinenko skripal and others who have broken with uh you know the 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 russian elites um have come under considerable uh, threat to their to their personal health um do you feel at all threatened 
uh, because of the fact that you you left and you continue to speak out? Well, it's hard, hard to say. There may be some threats, or they may maybe not. I don't know. I, I it's I don't know. If I were someone in Kremlin to to follow my case. I would uh, I would say that well it's it's is no one literally no name even there are a lot of people like me from Russian opposition or like Russian immigration who who keep speaking they speak the same things which I speak or even more aggressive and all and okay they and they have much uh, greater audience yeah. So a lot more are, of they, them now than when uh, Litvinenko yeah. and Khodorkovsky were speaking. There was a handful, and now there are yes, hundreds, yes. hundreds. Yes, and now, and now the uh, uh, mood in in the West is much less comfortable, much less uh, conducive to Putin than it was in the Litvinenko time. Mm. So I don't, I don't think that I should be picked up as a someone to you know to 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 make an example of. Rather, you, you know that no no one of Russian MFA followed my example, so to speak. Yes, and I, I didn't ex ex expect really that because all those who were disagree who disagreed with the with the war they left it. They left MFA before before myself. I think I I am the last. I'm the last, and I'm the last, and who did it out loud. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So I, I don't know how to answer your question. No, I think that's good. I think that puts it in perspective. It's uh, There's a lot more oppositionists, a lot more media uh, outside the country, and perhaps Putin only feels the threats now lie from within and those who remain in the country as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, and, and frank, frankly speaking, I don't pretend that I have ever had access to some some very, very you know top secret things, of course, of course not. So let's, I could uh, technically, you know, disclose well, what, what I was doing in Geneva, but <laughs> it's not a secret at all. So, so well, nonetheless, yeah. Boris, I mean, what you're doing, I think, is is brave in the circumstances. And it is good to, to, to have a strong voice like yours uh, trying to explain what's going on in the regime. And, um, you know, I know your time is, is precious. And uh, I really wanted to say thank you. For you uh, appearing on the channel and and sharing your experience of this. Thank you very much for your you know time.